So good uh, afternoon, everyone, if you are in Europe. Uh, good evening, if you are on my side of the world. So I hope you all appreciate my uh, standard issue uh, National University of Singapore School of Computing t-shirt. Uh, I wear, I'm wearing this t-shirt in honor of uh, Gabi, of course, because as you know, uh, she has been elected this year as the president of the ACM. Uh, no question, she deserved it, but more than that, we deserve her. We have uh, long uh, expected uh, such an election and we're very happy about it. So this is the opportunity tonight or today to hear from her, to ask the president of the ACM. Um, for those uh, who do not know the details, the ACM is the Association of Computing Machinery. It's a non-profit scientific and educational professional membership society. It's promoting academic and scholarly interest in computer science. And as its motto says, advancing computing as a science and a profession. It is the main professional society for computing professionals as we are. Uh, Gabby is a professor in computer science at Johannes Kepler University. She's a world-renowned educator and researcher in computing in general and in cooperative information systems in particular. So who better than Gabby can answer the question, what do we expect from future computing machinery? Let us welcome Professor Gabriel Kotsis. Gabby, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and also thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, to discuss with you a couple of questions and maybe also get mutual inspiration for our future directions in our research, in our academic life, in our professional life. When I was applying for the presidency, I was thinking about how could my presidential statement look like? How would I see ACM in the future? And I actually took the name, the wording of ACM literally, and I was thinking about what is computing machinery in the future? How will computing machinery look like in the future? We as technologists, we promote, of course, the technological changes in computing machinery. But we should also think about our social responsibility, about our responsibility for the society, for the globe, for our world that we live in. And we should take responsibility beyond the pure technology. So my vision for our discipline in general and for ACM specifically would be to promote computing machinery along solving the global problems that we are all facing. This is a huge task. My presidency will only last two years. So I need to put focus. And the focus that I have decided, and remember this was more than one year ago when I wrote the statement for the elections, the focus was for computing machinery on the one hand, fighting the CO2 dilemma. Nowadays, we are doing a lot of meetings virtually, so we are contributing actually a lot against or towards fighting the CO2 dilemma. But I think there is much more that we as scientists can contribute in that respect, ranging from simulations up to reducing our own CO2 footprint, what we are actually doing right now with this meeting, up to um, creating energy aware technology and all those things. The second thematic area, and it's also very up to date nowadays, would be computing machinery, helping and promoting advances in medicine and healthcare. And again, I think these are global problems. And the current pandemic situation has shown us that if researchers all over the world work on a specific problem, answers, promising answers can be found quite quickly. 
And the last topic that I personally think is very relevant, I'm living in Austria, which claims to be a democratic country with accessibility to um, democratic principles for all the people, would be computing machinery supporting democracy, promoting democracy, fostering democracy. What I think is fascinating about technology is that it's always two sides of a coin. In all the examples that I've given to you, we have a lot of experience where technology actually helped mankind, helped us for better lives, solved a lot of problems. But there's also always a risk associated with technology. Technology can always be on the good side, but could also be used on the so-called bad side. Just think about the last example that I've mentioned, technology, computing machinery, promoting democracy. It could also be used as a tool preventing democracy, preventing people from getting information, from getting access to democratic principles. So there's always this up and down side. And this, I think, is something that we in the future should consider better in um, thinking about our disciplines. I would like to conclude those first few initial words with a couple of thoughts um, where ACM actually contributes, in my opinion, quite successfully to our discipline and also would like to mention a few of our future initiatives and we can then talk about this more in more detail. So one of the initiatives that we took already in June before my presidency actually started was that we want to transform the ACM digital library into an open access library. Because we do believe that access to information, as I've emphasized before, is vital to promoting science to the benefit of the society. We have to make sure that the results that we publish are accessible to a wide community so that a large audience can benefit from that. So that's a big goal. Another big goal would be in the field of education and promoting young people in their careers, may it either be academic, scientific or professional careers. So we have a lot of activities for young people. For example, we are offering um, for this year, because again of the pandemic, a one year free complementary membership to students for ACM so that they can have access to all the material for free for at least one year. We are organizing selected events for students. I have had the pleasure this summer to participate virtually in the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, where people who have um, achieved prestigious awards in computer science and also in mathematics would meet with the younger generation to discuss their needs. And I was participating in a session on discussing the career outlooks, the career possibilities, specifically in the academic community. It was quite interesting, inspiring to see what to the young generation, what does the young generation think. And last but not least, of course, also ACM is um, doing a lot of efforts in specific thematic areas. You probably all know the special interest groups of ACM that do the actual content technology oriented work in the various subfields of our discipline. And here I'm personally very much interested in this interplay of human and computers, not so much in the traditional way of human computer interaction, but rather in the way of human computer cooperation and human computer teaming. Because we do see that computers or computing machinery is exhibiting now features that were in the past dominantly human tasks. Think about all the advances that we see in artificial intelligence. Machines can become very specialized now and solving some of the problems that typically are humans have been good at in the past at a better rate. They're still very specialized. So I do not believe in those science fiction horror scenarios of computers replacing humans. But I do see that we need to think about how can we best team the competences of humans and machines. And this is something that me together with my team at the Johannes Kepler University, the Department of Telecooperation would like to work on in the future. So I think this would it be for an introduction and I'm open now for further questions and discussions. Thank you very much. So Gabby, if you allow me, maybe I'm going to ask the, the first question. 
Um, I found in Oscar Wilde a, a quote where he says, progress is the realization of utopias. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously not dystopias. Uh, and as you said, there are two sides of the coin, and I was looking at the other side of the coin, you know, credit scoring, uh, face recognition, contract tracing, well, maybe we have to decide which side of the coin it is, uh, minority reports, uh, not just great movies, and um, transhumanism. So may I disagree with the question you're asking? not the answer, the question. When you say, what do we expect from future computing machinery? Uh, one way of hearing this question is as if humanity has no say in what is the uh, disruption that is going to happen. Uh, Karl Marx in, in his Capital chapter 15 was calling it creative destruction. We now call it, it disruption. So uh, instead of asking this question, I would like to ask uh, a, a different question. What should we require from computing machinery in particular, but also of course, by those who implement it, who design it. So the professionals you represent through the ACM to avoid the realization of the worst dystopias. And in fact, to put us on a track we on a track which is beneficial for humanity. So what should we require from machinery and what is the role of the ACM uh, going in this direction? Actually, I would even maybe then rephrase the question one more time because we are the designers of the future. So probably we should replace the question and say, how should we design future computing machinery? And what ACM does, I can take some very practical examples from the things that, that you have mentioned. For example, for the contact tracing apps, at ACM, we have so-called technology policy councils. They are probably not that known because they more or less work internally, but they do become visible in terms of the reports that they are issuing. So for example, the European Technology Policy Council, the TPC Europe, has recently published an article on how contact tracing apps should be designed in order to be beneficial, in order to be on the good side. So there are a few technical requirements, like for example, transparency of the code, et cetera, et cetera. And there are also, of course, a lot of legal and ethical considerations that have been put together. Another example would be the um, TPC US, the um, American Technology Policy Council, and there's also a global one, so we are splitting a little bit in the geographic regions, has recently issued um, two statements. One of them was related to the bias in artificial intelligence, which is a big problem. Because if you train systems by means of a lot of data from the past, you're somehow enforcing what we know from the past and therefore even enforcing existing bias, which might be very critical. You mentioned the minority reports. So this is something, but this is still work in progress. We don't have all the answers yet, but at least we can ask the right questions. And we have also issued um, one statement about facial recognition and again saying um, what would need to be considered. So I think ACM as an organization cannot provide all the answers, but at least it can um, help both the decision makers as well as the designers and developers, but also the users in creating awareness for the problems. So we should not believe that all technology is good or all technology is bad. It's neither one or the other because it's what we made out of the technology. Thank you, Gabby. I think we can uh, open the floor for questions for the other attendees. So uh, if you want to ask a question, I think you just open your mic and, and ask Gabby.
but just type a question in the chat. That's also an option. I'm watching the chat if you want to say something. Hello, Gabi. Nice to see you. Hi, Dirk. Hope you are fine. Everything's good in Austria. Also locked down these days, right? That's true, yes. So all the best greetings from Tallinn, Estonia. Um, maybe some little bit, some principle quest, some more basic question, fundamental question about actually computer science. So from the perspective of ACM, where are we heading? Um, with respect to me as academics now, from that perspective, as um, in the last decade, what I feel very much that we are at least in Europe through the Horizon program and so on, that we are more and more go going into the direction of uh, applied science. Yes, this concerns me a little bit. On the other hand, I also see, of course, the benefits of that. So, is there some is there some idea in ACM? Where are we heading? Should we go more into the direction of the applied sciences or applied science, or is it still is it still important and, and an important value also to strengthen fundamental science and, and so on? Because we have seen everything in, in ACM over all the years, as far as I perceived it, very fundamental research and also applied science and so on. Maybe it's in the balance, or is there is there an idea of ACM and so on? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I am hoping that not in the near time, but maybe in the midterm, we overcome this distinction because it doesn't make sense anymore. As you said, you see in ACM both applied science, theoretical science, and the whole spectrum in between. So what's the purpose of distinguishing? And especially if we talk to other disciplines, there's always this um, connotation of Theoretical science is the good science, the pure science, the valuable science, and applied science is the stuff where you can get the money from. And I think this is completely wrong. We need both. And actually, we need more than those two extremes. We need to, um, we, we, we need the basic findings in order to build applications on top of that. And my, my true vision would be that we at least in the midterm overcome this clear distinction and at least overcome this connotation of um, higher and lower value, because I think this is definitely not true. Unfortunately, you have been mentioning funding agencies. Mm -hmm. Funding agencies still are counteracting my vision, because also in Austria, for example, if we get funds from FWF, from our National Science Foundation, they mainly mm -hmm. fund theoretical basic mm -hmm. research. This is higher ranked in the reputation, in the awards from the ministry and the financial award than if we do cooperation with industry, which is sometimes much more challenging, sometimes much more time consuming, and sometimes also much more inspiring. So I think the, the future hopefully would be that um, all the people understand we need research in different perspectives in a whole continuum from the basic findings up to the not only um, applied research, as you called it, but even to smaller innovations, which still have their ground somewhere in, in the basic research findings. Um, I do agree, for example, if you look at the recipients of the Turing Award, also there you would see that it's not only the pure theoretical basic results that are funded, but um, pretty much application oriented. So the, the last laureates were coming from the field of computer graphics, and mm. their findings found it into the, um, into the movie market, which is a very competitive and very, very high income market. So I think this is, um, uh, we, we do already see some tendencies that there is more, more cycle, more interplay between the two disciplines, between the two areas. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you. But maybe one more remark, because I've also been mentioning initially um, my concern about the career for young people. I uh, think for them, it's even more difficult because they typically need to decide still, would they rather stay in academia? Would they rather go to um, industry? Would they stay at a research institute? And depending on which kind of career they expect, they also need to shape 
their career. And it's not so easy to migrate from one track to another. That's also some vision that I have for the future, that it's more easily to shift between the different roles because that it, it will definitely be beneficial. We have some examples of professors and you have the same, I think, at your university because you're also a technical university. People coming from industry, going back to industry. And this is very, very valuable for both sides. Exactly. Valuable and sometimes not easy to... Yes, if you just think about your own career, it's probably not a good advice. Yes. <laughs> So I, I would like to get the, the point of view of some of the audience member. Uh, Christine Strauss is, is with us. Christine, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Christine, so from your point of view, uh, what would you recommend uh, Gabby to emphasize uh, as president of the ACM? Do you have any suggestions? Or, or points that uh, worry you? Um, well, I think Gabriela knows uh, your community better than I do, because I'm more from the economic side on electronic business. Um, I 100% agree with her um, in lowering the barriers to switch between industry and, re and research institutions because I think this is, I hope this is not a mistake to say it like that. It's an old fashioned view to make this strong distinction and to lower value the applied sciences. Because if you, if you have a look on, on what happened in industry, how far technology is developed, how quickly it is applied, then the level there is already high, yeah? So the, the difference between the levels is not that extreme like it was maybe 10 or 20 years before, yeah? So I agree with Gabriela to, to lower that barriers and maybe to rethink on the academic side um, if we really uh, want to go on like that or if, if how we can perform that change. And before, because Gabi said, um, yeah, it's also with the funding with FWF, the National Science Funding, um, that basic idea by saying, yeah, we have to pump money into, into fundamental research. I understand that. And um, like the applied science should be financed by industry itself. Um, well, it is a legal way to, to look at that. It's okay to look at that. But as this level raised in industry, it is not true any longer. Yeah. Gabriela, do you what do you think on that? Is that am I wrong? Is this too much BBL and uh, management science view, or does that uh, line up with the informatics? Um, no, I, I think that's that's very important that you bring in also this um, business perspective, this economic point of view. But again, as I said, um, for example, if you decide to start, for example, a career in research, the units on which you will be measured is mainly publications. And for example, if you have a strong record in working in industry, you probably don't have a strong publication record. So I think we also need to adjust the metrics on how we evaluate our performance. Wouldn't it also be necessary to, to consider that? So there is really, a, I do agree with you, it's, it's important to do that, but it's not that easy, unfortunately. I think it requires actually a, a lot of changes, a lot of changes in, in our mind settings and yeah, I mean, for us, we are in a phase where our careers are more or less matured and we know the track where we want to go. But I think for the young people, we need to give them better advice and um, how, how to shape their yeah. careers. Definitely true, because this uh, puts a lot of, of stress on, on the PhD candidates or even uh, master candidates. So, and I agree 100% with you because also my career path um, 
is uh, is some sort of evidence <laughs> and it is um, yeah hampering if you decide too late to switch over to academia yeah okay. yeah okay i think with my point i'm through mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Gabi, you mentioned the publications. Uh, can I have your personal, and I don't know, maybe your president uh, point of view, presidential point of view on uh, the uh, publishers and the uh, free access and, and this issue? Yes. So uh, first of all, my personal point of view for publications in general. I do hope that we can come back to a system where quality is more important than quantity. Because nowadays, if you look at your publication record or if you look at the publication record of somebody else, you count. You don't read the papers anymore, you count the number of papers. And this is definitely wrong. Um, with respect to open access, I personally was at the beginning very skeptical because I didn't really see good models on how to implement open access. I think times are changing now. There are now interesting models available on how to do open access because I think it's the wrong idea to ask, for example, the individual author to pay for his or her publication because this somehow leaves the impression you pay to get your paper published. But most publishers and ACM will follow a similar track, are more moving towards, for example, institutional payments. And then all the members of the institution can publish for free or payment from funding organizations, etc. So I think this is the right way to go. So I'm more optimistic that we are moving in the right direction. I do believe that at the end, what we need, what we want to have is open access because information publications should be accessible, especially if they have already been produced by means of public funds, as it is the case in most of our publications that, that we do. There is still a market for publications as well. If you publish a book, you probably would not like to have it open access because you want to make money from the book that also should be possible in the future that you as an author benefit from the results of your research work. So the financial aspect is still a little bit unclear but the demand for having information accessible to the people would be clearly a, an important one. Um, the ACM digital library currently is mainly a repository. So all of you are publishing in the digital library, but probably not too many of you are using the digital library as an instrument to search for publications. So this is also something that we would like or we would need to improve in the future if we go open access. It's not just enough that we collect and store all the articles, but we also need to provide um, efficient mechanisms of finding the information you need. I don't want to advertise now other tools, but um, also when I do a literature research, I not only search in the digital library, but I'm using different um, tools like, for example, the DBLP, which is not a repository, but which has very advanced features in finding articles, finding co-authors, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is also or not, I do not think it is one of the plans of ACM to team, for example, with such players to make the information, to make the content that we have in the digital library even more accessible. And last but not least, if I talk about accessibility, this also has two more dimensions. It also means that people with special needs, special requirements should get better access. This is one of the goals for the future developments. And we are also thinking about including other kinds of research artifacts apart from papers. Because most of us are producing papers, but more and more conferences have different formats like video presentations or the actual research material itself, the results of your simulation, the raw data, your programs. So the digital library the future digital library for ACM as an association for computing machinery should not be restricted to the PDFs of the documents. So I think we are also going to expand the content there. This is also one of the initiatives. Yeah, Bia, I would like to seek the reaction from, from some members of the audience. Uh, 
Nako uh, Kosuki, are you with us? Yes. Nako? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do, do, do you want to react on what Gabby has been saying about, you know, where we should direct our efforts uh, for computing from your point of view and from the point of view of uh, the researchers working with you? Um, actually, I'm, I'm researching about mm, healthcare topics, mainly. It, it's a little bit far from mainstream of the computing or something. So I'm wondering what should I do in, in the near future? Actually, I'm, um, I'm a little bit confusing, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think you're raising a very interesting point that uh, computing is not a separate science or a separate branch of engineering, but indeed is uh, the focal point of pretty much everything nowadays. So Gabi, do you want to react on this difficulty that every one of us is encountering, uh, being faced with uh, a variety of application domains and, and, and constraints coming from you know, various fields? Um, I, I wished I was a mathematician who could ignore the rest of the world, you know. <laughs> it will change also for the mathematicians, I'm sure. Um, well, I think that the answer for us is we cannot become experts in both, in the computer science as well as in the application domain. So the answer definitely is collaboration, and this is what all of us are doing. We rarely see single authored papers because there is um, already a lot of cooperation going on within our discipline, but also beyond our discipline. And when it comes to um, connecting then to the right communities, this I would agree is challenging. Um, because currently, for example, at ACM, we do not have a special interest group on health informatics. But if there would be a stronger community of computer scientists who is interested in working in this topic, we might start with a task force and maybe then in the future it could evolve into a special interest group. So this is the way how we create our chapters, our special interest groups, our topics. So the solution would be try to find a group of people that you would like to work with within computer science that have connections to health research. And I think in the first mom session yesterday, we had a lot of papers related to, to health issues, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, I don't remember if you have been presenting there, but there were a lot of papers in this first session. This could be a starting point. And um, then if there is a significant initiative, special interest groups come up and go depending on the actuality of the topics. So we are always open to new topics. Stefan, you are muted. Concrete, concretely, if, if Narco wants to uh, find out what she can do to uh, gather some professionals around the topic of interest to her, uh, or even, you know, if uh, PhD students, uh, no. they are the ones who have ideas, right? So, so uh, how can the, ad, how does the ACM give the initiative to people who have uh, needs, requirements, or ideas, and ideas. Yeah. The, the starting point would probably be to uh, connect to a thematically related ACM conference and try to start with a workshop there or with a birds of feather session. And then a nucleus could be built and this could grow over the months, couple of months, maybe even years, as long as it takes. And then it could evolve actually into a, a group because the conference organizers would then report to the board of the special interest groups. There's a board meeting. They meet, I think, every month and they observe if there are new topics, new thematic areas coming up. The alternative would be to take the shortcut. You have a group of people and you write me an email. This is an offer that I can give. We are a small group. So if you're really interested in promoting this topic, just contact me personally and I can help you in, in promoting and getting in further contacts. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm, I had a little trouble to find out what kind of conference do I have to submit a paper or uh, 
find a people who can work with me or something. So um, it, I'm so happy if you help me to find the conference or a friends or some someone. That's that's definitely possible. And my recommendation also would be um, not only look into your application domain, but also look into the conferences that relate to the technology that you use. So uh, I, I don't know what specifically you're doing in, in health informatics, but for example, if you apply techniques from data science, try to go to a data science conference and find people there. So this would be also one recommendation, not coming from the application side, but from the technology side, from the computer science aspects that you bring into. Actually, I think it's too many conferences now. So that's why I, I have a trouble to find out the correct. That's, that's, that's another problem that we are facing. It's too many, but this comes back to my point that I made before that I really would like to see in the future the paradigm of quantity going down and the paradigm of quality going up. But maybe the, the pandemic situation will change it a little bit because there's definitely not sufficient room for, for so many virtual conferences. So I'm really interested. This is another thing that I'm doing now currently as ACM president. I have shaped the task force on future conference formats because this is something that really we need to think about. Yes, please put some simple sentences that character, char characterize the conference or focus mm -hmm. on the conference. Very simple sentences first. Then I myself is a foreigner, not the native speakers in English, so I can find the conference yeah, yeah, much, yeah, yeah, much yeah. better, much faster, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, see, Ahmed Nas, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the by the way, for the interesting presentation. It was really helpful for me as a researcher. Uh, how I have, I have questions regarding the open access when it comes to book chapters. Um, I mean, there is two different ways, for instance, for an author, his, in their ever perspectives, but for a researcher, of course, we want to access to the information. Is there any steps for ICM that may um, give us kind of solution or something that may um, get access or benefit from open access as a researcher? And at the same time, um, I mean, satisfy also the author of the of the open book. Uh, you, what kind of books are you addressing now? Is it proceedings or is it textbooks, for example? Because the situation is is different in in. Those I think for proceedings. For proceedings, yes. So the the open access scheme will also work for the proceedings. That would be the same. I mean, already currently, authors would have the option of buying themselves the open access. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is a current model, a transition model. The plan would be to move to a fully open digital library within the next five years. And this okay. means also the proceedings volumes would be open access, of course, but um, the associated business models are not fully developed yet. So this is still work in progress on how and whom to charge for proceedings volumes. Mm, and that's for researchers, right? The goal would be that researchers don't have to pay. That's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. We want yeah. to shift the costs from publishing from the researchers towards the institution, whatever the institution is. Yeah. Christine, so you want to benefit both from free publishing costs and free access. Okay. I think Christine wanted to make a point on, on this topic. Uh, Christine, you want yes, to? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the open access uh, issue um, is something I would like to refer to. Um, Gabriela said uh, she would like to offer uh, through ACM some types of services and so on. Um, I am more extreme, I think, in my understanding because we as researchers, we are doing the research, we are generating the results, we are writing the paper, we are paying a native speaker to go over that uh, with a... Uh, uh, to, to edit that article. Then we are traveling somewhere, giving a talk. Um, and then we are maybe, and then our, our results are not visible to everybody. So I think research should be open for everybody. And that, that was something what at least I didn't understand when it happened uh, 10 or 15 years ago, that the publisher and the publishing houses took over so much power 
in that, I mean, sure, it is a business, yeah, I understand that. But I think we as researchers, we should try everything to make our results being open and accessible from everywhere and for everybody. And that may, um, may, may come to the issue of democracy, what Gabriela tackled in the very beginning. So I think it is an, it's an act of democratic um, behavior to make our results accessible to everybody. I know that is a hard job, Gabriela, to get that through, and it's a little bit fighting against windmills, yeah? <laughs> but, and as I said, we have an ambitious timeline. The goal would be to achieve this transition within the next five years. Yes, high spirits, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I have a, there's a suggestions from uh, Poi Li Te. You want you want to make your suggestion? Uh, oh yeah, I tried to turn on my uh, camera. So I'm very excited to hear about the open access because uh, we as a, a researcher from the university, we also wish that uh, our student can get access to uh, information. So if the university not really subscribes to the ACM, but of course our university, yes. Mm -hmm. So some of them will want to access to our information. They will send us a personal email. And uh, when we send to them, so asking them to just retrieve from ACM and they will, you know, uh, respond again, please send us, you know, so we will just, uh, just send it to them sometime. So I, I was just thinking when we do that, am I actually violate the copyright law and things that I sign in the beginning? So that actually caused a little bit in my uh, ethical thinking, the, the mental health <laughs> as well. So I really agree. So shall we actually start from our current proceeding? I, I was 2020. <laughs> so that was what I was uh, thinking. Yes, unfortunately, the current contracts do not allow us to put the things open access at the moment. And unfortunately, also, it's not a financially feasible option for us because it would exceed by far our budget. But as I said, the things will change. And um, the information that I have with respect to giving students to the materials, if this usage is restricted to your teaching obligations, it is okay. You may not use, for example, papers and hand it over for partners in an industry funded project because this would be then commercial usage. Okay. So it's quite tricky. But if it's just restricted to the purpose of teaching, you may give documents also to your students. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Dear, please. Mm, is there an opinion of ACM, or maybe it's even impossible to have an opinion of ACM about Alexandra Elbakayan and Sihab? Uh, no, we we the world is open access. You can get any any paper online, and even each book on LibGem. So yeah. my my books are all in LibGem. I have not put them there, so everybody can have my books for free. Well, maybe we should distinguish between legal and illegal open access. <laughs> but yeah, but the discussion gets a, gets a, in reality another direction now, right? Because you can have everything. It's just it's yeah. just no, I'm, I'm I'm not so convinced that you can actually have everything, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually you can get everything. Possible. Yeah, actually, you can also steal in the supermarket. <laughs> no, that's risky. You might get caught, but <laughs> risky. That's risky. Yeah. Well, it, it, it. I agree. There's a different risk level associated to that. That's true. Yeah, but, but I think so I think Gabby, you should you should recognize that um, this is a topic of concern for all scientists in general and for yeah. computer or computing scientists in particular. So maybe the hint here is that, uh, well, the community at large wants to have this, this discussion open. Uh, I, don't, I don't prescribe the, the conclusions yet, but uh, let's see what we yeah, think. 
may, may, may I uh, uh, ask for uh, more input? Maybe uh, Bushra Frit, do you want to share with us some of uh, uh, your points of view, either on the di current discussion or things you would expect uh, from the ACM uh, that could help you in your research? Bushra, are you with us? Okay, I think we have a problem mm -hmm. with the connection with Bushra. Yes. Unfortunately, Zoom is not very stable today. Also, we had problems in the morning, so it was like, ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe I'm just going to pick some someone randomly uh, from uh, from the screen that I see here. Uh, uh, Yohei Seki, uh, can you open your mic and uh, tell us what you think about the discussion and what you would hope from uh, from ACM? Yohei? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, uh, I didn't check uh, my comment, but uh, so I, I think uh, there are many, many uh, I'll speak up, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, in uh, this uh, conference, uh, smart city becomes a very hot topic in research field. But I think a special interest group uh, concerning smart city or research community is not so promoted in ACM. That, that's my impression. So uh, uh, how, how do you think about these, these topics? That's my uh, comment or question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, my response is similar to all the discussion we had before on the um, health informatics and, and medical informatics. Uh, to be honest, ACM is an organization with a long history. So we have been founded, um, I think, already during World War II. So it's really a long standing organization. And with that also comes some kind of already tradition. And I have to admit, and we are aware of the fact that we are not really very fast in catching up current trends and up-to-date topics, because we have the structure of our special interest groups, which are currently aligned along the traditional fields of um, computer science and um, computing machinery, let's say computer graphics, um, et cetera, et cetera, computer performance, computer architecture. So we are still pretty much technology oriented in shaping our community. And um, we are also a big organization. We have nearly 100,000 members worldwide. And this does not really give us the flexibility of opening up or catching up new topics very quickly from an organizational point of view. What would be, as I said before, the best option of bringing in new topics is making proposals for new conferences and then maybe then as a follow up new journal publications and things like that. So this, I think, would be the way to go to bring in new, more up to date topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yohe, for your question. Um, let's go around again. Um, uh, Suzanne Courtney, are you with us? Suzanne? Well, I think we, maybe I can yeah. ask a question to the audience because I would be interested. As I have been mentioning before, I have started this task force on future conference formats. You are currently sitting in a fully virtual conference. This has the advantage that you can participate without traveling. And this has the disadvantage that you can participate without traveling. <laughs> so it's both sides again. Um, my, my question would be, how do you see the future of conferences? Should we go for some kind of hybrid models where people both meet physically or virtually? We are currently discussing in ACM also some kind of um, satellite structures where, for example, groups of people 
meet in their local regions and then there are some plenary sessions which connect them virtually. So do you have any ideas, visions or plans on how you would like to participate in future conferences? Because at least for me, I would say if we go fully virtual, this will become boring after a couple of years. I really would like to have different formats. I mean, it works quite well what you're doing right now. And especially those kind of interactive sessions are fun to participate at. But um, in the long term, I think we have to think about new ways. Any ideas on that or any wishes that I could take home with? Dirk, please, yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, I would like a little bit also to break the wheel and not only talk about the, the media and um, organizational how we do it, but also about the conference and dynamics uh, intrinsically. So, you know, what we are doing in the conference, it's, it's always the same patterns. It's a 30 minute slot where somebody is presenting and then it's five minutes question. And this is just because at the NATO conferences, they have done this format. You know, we had another conference, they did it that way. And then since, how long is it ago? 30 years or more, you know, each and every single conference is in that style, you know, and it's always half an hour slot. And then we, okay, we have a panel and we have a keynote and so on, you know, but maybe also thinking from that direction, why, why can't a conference be just meeting and sitting together, discussing things, developing papers together, actually working together, actually doing research together, so that we, that then, you know, and then, then we have the proceedings, usually this is a standard, so maybe we have just, we should have the journals and the journals taking all these things that we are also doing at, in the proceedings, like being papers published with contributions and conferences also developing in the direction where we actually meet and work together. And this, sorry, this is all just a brainstorm and I am not prepared for that, you know. But, you know, that, that we meet actually when we want to meet and to interact to, together, because what we see currently, the current, the current conference formats work very well in the virtual world. Yeah, after, I still have problems in presenting online, to, to be honest, yeah, but we get better and better in that. So maybe, maybe this could also be a direction to think about the conference formats and what we actually do at the conferences, as opposed just to presenting research what we could also do in journals. Yeah, yeah. I, I fully agree to that. I would say, how long is it dating back? 20 years ago, I was attending a conference series which started exactly that way that you described it. It was called workshops <laughs> and they had post-conference proceedings. Mm -hmm. So the people would meet, they would give very short presentations and then groups of people would sit together and elaborate on joint papers. And the proceedings would be the joint papers of the discussion. Wonderful. I think I've participated to this conference for 10 years or so, and after five years, they changed slowly to this format that you just described, because people were saying, oh, we don't have the time to write the paper afterwards. So it was then a mixture of a short report by the organizers and the papers, and then at the end, it was the normal conference as we have it. But I do agree very much this, this would really be, a, be an interesting format. And it might also be uh, an answer to the questions that we have been discussing before, bringing up new topics. Why would necessarily all topics have to be precisely predefined? Why wouldn't new topics arise from interactions, from discussions? So I think that's that's something, a very good input. I like that idea, yeah. So maybe Gabby, if you want to uh, make sure that people are evaluated if they implement your suggestions, Make sure to promote the number of collaborators from different places uh, as, as a factor of uh, a measurement of the quality of, of the work. Yes, uh, if you want yeah. to encourage collaboration, this has to yeah. be taken into account as well. Uh, uh, I think, yeah. I think Bushra uh, Frick is back with us. Um, try again, please. Bushra, if you can ask your please. question. Yeah, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question for, uh, uh, thanks for Gabriel for your speech, and I have a question uh, concerning uh, the, the conferences uh, organization. I am a, a professor from Morocco, uh, but uh, here in Morocco, the many conferences uh, are organized uh, 
by it's a triple E section. And we don't have the uh, opportunities to organize a conferences uh, under the label of ASEAN. Uh, I want to, to know how can we plan to organize uh, conferences uh, with the uh, ASEAN collaboration here uh, in Morocco. Thank you. Okay, so um, there are multiple options. The fastest way is um, just submit a proposal to ACM and apply for cooperation. There are two ways of cooperation. The one is if ACM also sponsors the event and also takes financial responsibility. This might be difficult to get into at the first moment. And this is probably also not the one that I would recommend to you because to be honest, it's a little bit bureaucratic. And the second one is just an in-cooperation request, which means you would need some supporters, which are ACM members. Ideally, they are the chairs of the special interest groups where your conference would thematically belong to. So these are the two options for starting a conference immediately. The third option, which is a long-term option, I'm assuming if you have a lot of IEEE conferences that you have a local IEEE chapter maybe you want to consider founding an ACM regional chapter. So apart from the special interest groups, we also have regional chapters. There's for example, the German chapter of ACM, which is very active. And you might consider this as well. If you need more information on those practical aspects, just send me an email and I can provide you with the necessary links for further information. Maybe Gabi, you can, you can be a little bit more precise. So you say regional chapter, is it national or regional? So, for instance, in the case of Morocco, should it be a Moroccan chapter or, or North African or what is it? We, we call it regional chapters and it is possible to spread across multiple nations. It could be either within a nation or it could be across nations. Yes. Very good. Thank so you. So maybe the next chapter is from Morocco, Bushra. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> I will, uh, I will uh, do my best. <laughs> we, we count on you, yeah. Somebody wants to ask a question, I think? So I, um, is Eric Neholt still with us? Yes, I, I see his name, but I don't know if he can hear me. Eric, can you hear me? I think we are having quite some problems with mm. the connection. Sorry about this. Okay, I think uh, I think we will need to uh, to conclude at this stage. We have only uh, three minutes late. I wanted Eric to help me uh, conclude because he's an expert in open data. And, uh, and we see that the call that we are hearing from the audience is a lot about uh, sharing knowledge, uh, whether it's through uh, open papers, open libraries, open access, or uh, as, as you mentioned, Gabby, uh, through the organization of workshops uh, and conferences. So this is uh, very interesting because maybe it comforts you in having taken the decision to uh, become the president of the ACM to apply and be elected as the president of the ACM because there is a need for uh, uh, us to get together and organize uh, the communication of knowledge through papers, uh, through workshops, etc. I'm kind of interested that we did not go very far in specific topics, but what was uh, asked by the audience was more about how do we work together, how do we collaborate, how do we communicate. So based on this uh, assessment, Gabby, do you want to uh, bring sort of a momentary, temporary uh, conclusion and maybe now tell us what we should expect from you? Yes. Um, so first of all, I want to emphasize the fact that ACM is a volunteer organization. This means if you want ACM to do something, you have to do something, we have to do something because it is us. There is stuff at ACM which helps us in doing so, but it is us who create the initiatives. And this was also my biggest motivation for running for the presidency, for becoming a candidate, because 
I'm a person that likes to do something. I'm not the person that likes to sit back and complain about things that are wrong. I really would like to take action. And uh, for me, ACM is a great opportunity to achieve some of the things that I have on, on my agenda. And as you have mentioned, this aspect of communication and cooperation among scientists is for me personally interesting, but also for me in my professional life. I'm chairing the department of telecooperation. So we are working, we are doing research on cooperation, both across humans, but also among humans and machines. So I thought this also would be scientifically interesting and, and challenging for me. This is one aspect. And the second aspect is, um, as I've mentioned in the beginning in my statement, I want to emphasize one more. We are living in a global world in a positive sense. We should overcome not only the borders of our disciplines, we should also overcome national borders. Therefore, I would prefer to talk about regions rather than nations, because we do live in different regions, but uh, difference doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other. And we are all working together. We all have to work together to solve our global problems and to make all of our regions a better world. Um, I think this would be my um, closing words, and I would like to invite all of you to become active participants. I'm not saying that I want to become all of you ACM members, because I hope that you are already members. If you're not, then please join and help me in shaping ACM and shaping the future computing machinery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabby. I still haven't found out how we can all clap together. Oh, I see some of the organizers. I found the button. Um, but there must be a better way. I think the, the ACM uh, 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 engineers should find out how we could you know, effectively clap. Uh, thank you very much. I think you are indeed the best person. Uh, your message is very clear and it answers a lot of the questions. Uh, I want to thank everybody, Bushra, Naoka, Dirk, everybody uh, for having uh, participated. Unfortunately, there's a, a big... Uh, issue today, Zoom has a lot of problems from many countries, so not as many people uh, could uh, join as uh, they wanted, as we also would have wanted, but this was very fruitful. Thank you very much again, Gabby. And One more comment, for those of you yes, who please? not watch, this session has been recorded and it will be available on YouTube for later on, for, to be seen later on also. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabby, Bye. and goodbye, everybody. Stay healthy. Ciao. Thank you, Stefan. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>